Uh, like I said, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Wright. I'm the Education Specialist for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And we are definitely uh, happy to have everybody here for our first event of 2022, uh, our first book talk and our first event. Um, so we're very excited. We have a great uh, 2022 calendar lined up for everyone this year. And you can always find all the details of our upcoming events at wisvetsmuseum.com. Um, like I said, today we are welcoming Annette Grunsa, uh, who is going to be talking about her uh, latest work, Combat in Campus. Uh, and she's going to be looking at not only uh, her brother's situation in Vietnam, but at the same time, her situation back here on the home front at the University of Wisconsin and Madison. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I'd just like to remind everybody, please, if you have any questions for the author as we're going through the event today, uh, you can submit those questions to me via the chat function on Zoom. Uh, I will be putting all those questions into a PowerPoint and be presenting those at the end. And uh, also before we get started, I would like to say thank you to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation and their executive director, Ms. Jennifer Carlson. Uh, they do a fantastic job of supporting us for all the Also, I would like to say uh, thank you to our sponsor, Generac Power Systems. Um, without Generac Power Systems, or without the uh, Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation, we would not be able to support all this free programming that we get to put on. Uh, with that in mind, uh, speaking of free programming, Annette, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Uh, we're absolutely ecstatic to have you in here today, and uh, we are definitely looking forward to your presentation. So without any further ado, uh, Annette, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Eric. Um, thank you, Eric, and to the Veterans Museum and to the Foundation for hosting me today. I'm just delighted to be here. And I would like to thank my publisher, Ruth Crocker, and I think she's here. I just saw her pop in with Elm Grove Press, and she's in Old Mystic, Connecticut. And uh, I want to thank Ruth for believing in the uniqueness of this book and for publishing it. Later, we're going to share a story about how, how we met. Uh, so right now I'm going to start, um, share my screen here, because I have a PowerPoint that will help give you some visuals. So can you see that? I'm hoping everything is visible there. Yeah, it all looks good, isn't it? Okay, so there's the cover of my book, Combat and Campus, Writing Through War. And I would like to thank my brother, first of all, for writing the letters. And also my parents, Al and Betty Langlois, who are both World War II veterans, and they kept these letters in a safe deposit box for 50 years. And they talked about the letters, and I read them often as they came in, as I was um, through the years. And I had copies of them that I made for our kids to read when they were in high school. It was something that our family valued, and my mother often talked about having a book made with these letters. Um, my brother, however, did not want to revisit. He put Vietnam behind him, and I don't think he revisited the letters. And he didn't live, he lived in Minnesota and then in Iowa, so he wasn't near our parents' house often enough to, to look at them. So um, he, he kind of buried the Vietnam stories. Actually, I started seriously working on the book when LZ Lambeau, the Vietnam Veterans event, um, uh, was organized in Green Bay in May of 2001. So that was about almost 21 years ago. And I saw books that were published and letters that had been written. And I thought, oh, my brother's letters are, are just as good, maybe even better. So it gave me, um, the seed was planted. And it really took the pandemic for me to pull it together and, and finish it. It's a hybrid. It's uh, my brother's letters that he wrote home, uh, starting with basic training and through his year in Vietnam. He had just graduated from UW-Madison with a journalism degree, and then he was drafted. And the book also contains my prose. I put some historical prose in, but I'm really a poet, so it includes poetry and includes my story on the home front at UW-Madison, where I was a freshman the same year that he went to Vietnam in 1968. So I published the book as a promise to my parents. It was my mother's dying wish that we do something about the book. Um, 
So I really wrote this to honor my brother and my parents and to honor all Vietnam veterans who did not receive a proper welcome home. So it begins with, let's see if I can get this to slide there. Um, we begin with, here's just a sampling of his 36 letters that he wrote from basic training through his year in Vietnam. And you'll see that um, he was in the US Army, the 25th Infantry Division. And it was, uh, their tagline was Tropic Lightning. And it looks like it's supposed to be a, like a palm leaf of a tree and a lightning bolt, but everybody called it the electric strawberry. That's what I remember my brother saying. So at the same time, I was a freshman in the fall of 68 at UW-Madison and I was walking up Bascom Hill behind the National Guard pretty often. So I'm just going to begin with uh, Peter's first letter and then share some poetry and letters as I go through. Um, so this is where Peter was. He was in the infantry in the army. So he was in the jungles in, uh, in combat and he was stationed in Daotiang. They flew into Saigon and then they were gradually moved out. And you'll see that it's, it's a little northwest of Saigon. He arrived on the day before his 23rd birthday. So July 18th in 1968. And the next day he turned 23. So what a birthday. He talked about having a 22 hour flight getting there, stopping in different places along the way. And then he said his last line in his first letter home was, Vietnam is terrible. Everything smells like garbage including your body because of the heat and humidity. So we were both arriving. By fall, I was on the UW campus. So here's a poem I wrote called The Arrival. Vietnam, my brother's first letter. Stinking, steamy, no privacy, no doors, no locks, no barracks, bunkers, few possessions, nothing to gain everything to lose. Madison, me on campus, freshman, cool autumn air, red and yellow trees, marching band, football, new faces every day, dorm room, my own lock, my own door with a lock, good roommate, textbooks, notebooks, everything to gain, nothing to lose. So Peter was in uh, the 2nd Battalion of the 22nd Infantry. It's also referred to as the Triple Deuce. And he sent um, an early letter home that kind of talks about their, their setup. He goes, the 22nd Infantry is mechanized. In other words, the primary means of movement is with armored personnel carriers or tracks. And you can see pictures of tracks there. Uh, there's one personnel carrier for each squad within a platoon. So in one company, there are 16 uh, tracks. And here's, uh, whoops, 16 tracks. Um, within a, a 16 tracks, each with a 50 caliber machine gun and two M60s. Everyone but the driver rides up on top of the track because the inside area gets completely blown to, to hell if the track hits a mine in the road. The track also serves as the squad's house. We sleep eight men in our track at extreme close quarters. Hammocks and ammo cans seem to make the best beds. Then he continues on. They often went on night patrols. Um, and he goes, last night I was on an ambush patrol in the rain. More than likely each night is spent sitting out on the boondocks and getting soaked. We can't use ponchos because they reflect light and are noisy. This might give away our position, so we just wear jungle fatigues and no underwear. Helps you dry out faster. At any rate, last night it was pouring like hell, so the patrol leader decided to set up the ambush in a Vietnamese hooch, a thatched house the locals call home. The people who live there are set, set up sleeping platforms for most of us, and they were very helpful and friendly. I spent the night behind a machine gun set up in the front doorway. It's hard to imagine, but he wrote such detail in his letters that it kind of puts, puts, puts the reader right there. He continues, of course, everyone here seems to be good sports and everyone acts and treats his fellow soldier like a brother. 
we find humor one way or another <clears throat> uh, to keep our minds off the tragedy and the idiocy of this war. One of the fellows in my squad bought a baby monkey and tamed it for several months. I swear the little imp is human. He sits on the top of the 50 caliber turret when we're moving with the tracks. On smooth portions of the road, he'll perch right on the barrel. As I'm riding, Tiger is perched on my shoulder, picking at my ears and scratching my head for me. I hope when I get a camera, I can send you some pictures of him and the rest of this madness. Okay, I'm going to switch to a little bit how we grew up. Uh, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, uh, boys played war and girls played house. So here's a, a poem called Pears. True story. Growing up in the shadow of World War II, my brother grabs a pear from the green stamp fruit bowl, pulls the stem out with his teeth, pretends to throw it, making hand grenade blasting sounds. He arranges green army men on the floor for attack and retreat plays war games in a foxhole dug into the empty lot next door. As a Boy Scout, he learns survival, camping out on weekend bivouacs. With dad, he hunts pheasant, partridge, and sometimes deer. He becomes a good shot. Like his father, uncle, and grandfather, he grows up to serve in the military. His draft number comes up at college graduation, 1967. After basic training, he flies off to Vietnam hastily prepared. He has issued old weapons from past wars, has no rain gear for monsoon season. My parents buy a rain suit and mail it to him. His letters tell of living in the track as they sweep the jungle, rolling through rice paddies, dodging snipers and ambushes. His letters describe mortar attacks, direct hits, and missing limbs. Scouting and hunting skills keep him alive in that jungle. And he tells me, you have it easy because you're a girl. You weren't forced into war or that kind of fear. Well, maybe I have it easier, but whenever I eat a pear, I feel his burden. My guilt ignites as the taste of pear explodes in my mouth. So then he would, he wrote later of some missions they went on and a lot of them were at night, but some were during the day. And here's one that he described. His letters are quite graphic and I'll just give you a little sampling of one of them. Late in the afternoon, the tracks broke through the far side of the rubber plantation. In the distance, we could hear the volume of fire increase indicating that the ground troops now had made heavy contact. As we moved down a narrow road leading into dense foliage, the whole world suddenly seemed to open fire on the tracks. To be exact, the tracks were caught in an ambush. The enemy had our position on the road zeroed in for mortars. The ambush was sprung by simultaneously firing mortars, rifle propelled grenades, and heavy small arm and machine gun fire. One mortar landed in front of our track and another behind it. Bullets were ricocheting off armor and cracking over our heads. Within seconds, our radio was crackling with screams of, medic, medic, I need a medic fast. Then, hold your fire, don't shoot the 50s, you'll hit our own troops. For Christ's sake, get a medic, we've got a man bleeding to death. The sergeant is hit, his face is covered with blood. God, someone get a medic. So he continued to describe the rest of that battle, and then he gets into uh, another area, or he, he finishes off where he said, since that firefight, we found dozens of bunkers near Go Dao Hao. Each day was spent destroying, destroying them. And he said, each day we kept adding added sandbags to our bunker in anticipation of a mortar attack on the battalion logger site. Everyone is tense and dog tired. The sun burns daily and torrents of rain make the landscape muddier every night. This is Vietnam at present, a muddy, stinking hell. So my brother could really write. I really appreciate um, how he shared that. So one of the problems that he had that was um, sunburn. And he worried about the heat and the humidity uh, as much as anything. And here's part of one poem that describes 
how he was there. In Vietnam, my fair-skinned brother suffered heat rash, blistered lips, sunburn, nicknamed red by his buddies. He endured stifling nights, sun-scorched days while the politics of war heated up at home. Soldiers lived by the calendar, crossing off the days, one by one, for staying alive. So meanwhile, that slide is changing all by itself. I don't know how that happened. Anyway, meanwhile, on the UW campus, uh, this is a poem I wrote called UW Campus Life. Greek was out, demonstrations were in, students weren't rushing into rush week, pledging was down, fraternities and sororities dwindling. Students pledged instead to march and protest. Cheerleaders at Yell Like Hell, the pep rally at the Union for Homecoming, could not compete with Hell No, We Won't Go. And you'll see on the upper left slide, that's a picture of a guard standing outside of Bascom Hall. And the others, um, I think it's the Commerce Building and Van Nuys um, with some of the de uh, demonstrations. So here's another uh, poem, Bayonets on Campus. In my brother's shadow at the same Big Ten school, I began freshman year, first time away from home. The National Guard marches up Bascom Hill in formation. They parade in unison like warriors. Face shields pulled down, rifles with bayonets propped on shoulders. My brother sends letters from Vietnam. He has an M16, hand grenades, tear gas, and describes surprise attacks on nighttime jungle sweeps. Mortars crack over their heads in a ball of fire. A landmine explodes beneath a tank. Mother writes to me of the empty nest at home, says the quiet is deafening. She cries for her son's safety. She cries for my safety. My brother writes, the headline of the Pacific Stars and Stripes newspaper reads, Bayonets on Campus in Madison. As a recent grad, he jests, that sounds about normal. I feel the burn of tear gas. I fear guns on campus, guards standing at attention outside my classroom door. Police wield clubs against students. I dodge canisters of tear gas lobbed at my dorm. As protesters run inside, I shake with fear during riots on campus. I shake with fear even more for my brother in Vietnam. So we had some neighbors he wrote letters to and those neighbors also um, shared those letters with us. And they had a son that was in high school and he had written to Peter and asked, what is it like in Vietnam? What's the, do you believe in the war? Are we making progress? So my brother having had some political science classes, I think very astutely wrote a letter back to him. And he describes the situation. The armed forces make the mistake of not explaining to the servicemen why they are being sent to Vietnam and what we're trying to accomplish. This is not a declared war. We haven't been attacked on our own soil and therefore there is no great spirit of nationalism and positive popular support. Dissent at home has produced many people who doubt our intentions, as ambiguous as they may be, including GIs. As a result, the most striking GI characteristic is his great apathy toward the whole Vietnamese conflict. Command information is a total farce. When we leave our camp in the morning, no one except a few officers really know what the mission is. No one has made much of an attempt to encourage GIs to respect Vietnamese people their customs, religion, and mode of living in general. And you can see some pictures here of, of, of life there. And quite often there would be people selling things to the GIs when they're out in the, in the combat zone, which was, he said, quite amazing. He continues, the GI in short finds it hard to sense any purpose for his presence in Vietnam and naturally loses pride in his work because little if any personal satisfaction is derived from it. A favorite GI phrase that is applied to just about any incident is, the hell with it, it doesn't mean a damn thing. Another great, another great problem stems from a conflict between the military, political, and social goals. For example, an army medical team will enter a village of illiterate farmers and establish rapport by offering much needed medical help. Next, the VC threaten the people's lives for cooperating with the Americans. Next, the military gets wind of VC in the area 
and during the ensuing combat, the village and many civilian inhabitants are consumed. What have we accomplished? Nothing except to instill hostility in the now suspicion, suspicious and doubting villagers. In effect, it's a vicious, insane circle. We're trying to proliferate a paradox of conflicting goals. The military and civic-minded leaders operate independently instead of cooperatively. The thought most in all our minds is thinking ahead to the day the freedom bird will fly us back to the world. So my brother had some really good insight into things, even before we knew about it in the news. So I'm going to share just a couple other things. Um, two poems and a letter that I wrote to my brother. In my, my response to that letter really is a poem called Measures of War. Walter Cronkite in our living room every night was the trusted face of reporting the war with a half a million boots on the ground in Vietnam. Secretary of Defense McNamara, former whiz kid of the auto industry, must now measure progress of this war. What can he count on to confirm success? My brother writes letters home from the front line. He tells of combat, jungle sweeps, ambushes, his buddies dying, grief pouring out like blood. My brother asks, why are we here? What's the objective? McNamara measures bodies like cars rolling off the line. He counts enemy lives lost, says we are winning. Walter reports our soldiers lost, our dead. And that's the way it is night after night. My brother writes of friends killed, fears for his life, counts down the days. Mother, a veteran, dizzy with distress of yet another war, lost her brother in the last one. She lies awake at night, worrying for her only son. Secretary McNamara and President Johnson declare, progress is being made. My brother writes, there is none. And Walter reports, the way it is. The common denominator is death, where every body counts. Here's a letter that I wrote to my brother. Um, in uh, March of 1969. Dear Peter, I'm going to classes, but some days it gets really hard. I was heading down University Avenue to my sociology class when a line of National Guard linked arms in front of the building where my class is held. One guardsman in riot gear shoved a club into my stomach, yelling at me to leave. I told him I was just trying to go to class and that I was not part of the demonstration. He didn't believe me, so I had to leave and miss my class. That was scary for me to get a club in the gut when I wasn't part of it at all. The lobby of Chadburn Hall was pepper gassed again yesterday. I came in from my afternoon class and could hardly breathe. I kept coughing and my eyes burned. I think the gas goes onto the vents because we were still coughing in our room on fifth floor that night. This has been happening pretty often over the past couple of weeks. My roomie and I decided to move away from the action to the Lakeshore dorms. We're moving out to Liz Waters soon. Most of the protests are in the Southeast dorm area. I'm really tired of the riots and tear gas. I have a philosophy class, 8.50 a.m. on Tuesday and Thursday. I was following a formation of guardsmen up Bascom Hill to go to a class a couple days ago. When I went to my classroom on second floor of Bascom Hall, there was a National Guard guy in riot gear, a clear face mask pulled down over his face holding a gun with a bayonet, standing outside my classroom door. At least this time I could go to my class. It's unnerving to have guards with guns outside each classroom in this building. I hope you are staying safe. I wish you were here on campus with me. It would be good to have some family here. Much love, your little sis. So here's a, another poem, Headlines of War. Shocking letters arrive at home with tales of concealed tunnels and Viet Cong ambushes from everywhere and nowhere. GIs are blown up like action figures. Mother loses sleep riveted to the news. She examines casualty counts, praying it won't be her son. Life magazine features faces of the dead, yearbook style filling 12 pages in one issue. Campus protests escalate as coffins arrive home, rolling across national TV. Silent with worry, 
Dad shares his son's letters with the local newspaper. The letters are published. It's one thing Dad can do to help other families who worry for their children away at war. These parents call my parents in mutual support and worry. At the university, I go to class, avoid protests and police, stay out of harm's way for my mother's sake. And then miraculously, my brother returned home and you'll see a newspaper photo. And because there was such a following in our hometown of Wausau, that's Wausau, Wisconsin, the, uh, a newspaper photographer showed up at the airport on the day that he was coming home and caught this picture, which I just love. And this poem is called Chopsticks. You brought home gifts from your tour of duty as if from a pleasure trip. A mini camera for dad, a scarf for mother, and for me, chopsticks from Vietnam. Two slender black sticks, the color of onyx, glistening in my hands, each with inlays of pearly shell, iridescent and marbled gold. They made beautiful tools for eating, people forced into famine, their food defoliated by war. You choked back that year of jungle sweeps and body bags, all of it hard to stomach. But you managed to forage a few gifts, bringing me jeweled chopsticks, tools of sustenance, a souvenir of your survival. And this is my favorite picture of Peter and it's on the cover of the book. Um, just, it says so much about Christmas. He wrote one letter to me telling me that it's pretty hard to feel Christmassy when it's 95 degrees and humid. And he said, bah humbug, I just don't feel like yippee yuletide. Anyway, so he made it home and um, this is just, I'm gonna close with this poem and then we can um, go to some question and answer. And um, so this is called A Second Chance to Live. A foxhole saved you in Vietnam on that miserably hot, humid night. You told us how your buddies opted to sleep above ground to escape the stifling heat in that bunker. The mortar landed on top of them, but in the depth of that foxhole, the depth of the foxhole saved you. The blast blowing you into the wall. You came home. They didn't. Partly deaf from ruptured eardrums and shrapnel peppered in your flesh, you were given a second chance to marry, have children, become a husband and dad, to be a news reporter and a public relations pro. It was a good second life with family, some skiing, sailing, and a little camping thrown in. It would have been happily ever after, except for buried anger, your knotted silence, and those cancer cells burning bright orange. And I'll stop there and just say to all Vietnam veterans out there, welcome home, because that was not something that happened back in, in the late 1960s and 70s. Our Vietnam veterans were not recognized as they should have been. So I'm hoping that this book has done some good to help honor those veterans. Um, I put a couple of resources up here. I had uh, the publisher's um, website, elmgrovepress.org, up on the first slide. And here's mine. I have on my website, annettegrunseth.com, photos. I have a blog about some of the backstories of things that have happened since the book came out. There are lots of coincidences. And you can also buy my book on my website. I autograph all the copies that are purchased through me, and I offer a slight discount from Amazon and some of the other sources. Uh, after the book came out and uh, through Ruth Crocker, the publisher, um, I've connected with some of the people in my brother's unit. And it, the Triple Deuce has a website, vietnamtripledeuce.org. And my brother had a wonderful photo album that he identified many people in the pictures. So I've posted a lot of those pictures out there with names. Um, so if there's somebody looking to connect, they can go to that website. So now I think um, I'd like to stop the screen share here. And uh, I know Ruth is here and maybe we can talk uh, a little bit and share some of our stories. So I'm back. 
Give me just one so, second, Annette. I'm going to find Ruth on here and hey. unmute her. There she is. I have to share how we met. So it's kind of an amazing story. It's because of this piece of paper and it's real faded. You can hardly read anything on it. And it was back when, uh, 1991, my brother went to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall in Washington, DC with his family. And he did rubbings of people that were important to him. So these are the little slips of paper. And these fell out of the back of, of Peter's um, photo album one day. And uh, it was probably a winter day like today. And I thought, well, I'll just Google some of the names. And my brother had, uh, had a lot of um, respect for their commanding officer, uh, Captain David Crocker. And that was one of the, um, Captain David Crocker was uh, tragically killed suddenly in Vietnam. And that just tore my brother apart. So it was part of his post-traumatic stress uh, living with this. So he did a rubbing of his name and then several others, um, the fellows from that bunker. Anyway, I thought I'll Google. So I Googled Captain Dave Crocker and his information came up, but then information about Ruth Crocker came up and she's a book publisher and she's written a book uh, of her memoirs of her husband's death and then her life uh, that continued on. So I sent her an email and I think in about 10 minutes I had a reply and we started corresponding and I told her what I had and we started sharing back and forth and she looked at the manuscript and, um, and she published the book. So if I hadn't found this piece of paper, I wouldn't have met Ruth and we've developed a really wonderful friendship online so far. I hope to meet you one day in person. Hi, Annette, I'm here, but uh, Eric has to start my video if you want to see my face. <laughs> okay. Can you do that, Eric? Yes, I can. Just give me a second here. Let me find her on the list. I unmuted Anyone's her, but I completely forgot to start the video. Here we go. Um, I actually cannot do that without starting everybody's video. So sorry, Ruth. Well, that's okay if you want to. I mean, I, we have, unless you, you don't think you can have everybody on. Actually, Ruth, I'll make you a co-host and then you should be able to start your own video. Okay. Right. Oh, there we go. Okay. There, oh, there, there she is. <laughs> and we've only met online, but we'll meet one day. COVID has kept us apart. <laughs> Every time there's a conference or something, we just, it gets canceled. So so anyway, Ruth, you're just a real important person to me because of this connection. Yeah, and, and you to me too, because um, it's so uh, going through this experience as we did with Annette as a sister and me as a, as a wife, um, you know, I mean, thankfully Peter came back, but, um, I, I've really appreciated connections with people who knew my husband back at that time, because, um, as I mean, many people are aware, there was such a great long silence after the war where we just didn't talk about it. And, and, uh, for many reasons. So, um, I'm just, I'm thankful to meet Annette and to support publishing her book, which is a wonderful book and uh, look forward to the future. Oh, well, thank you. Another thing that happened too, is that Ruth, you were connected uh, by another coincidence of meeting people from the, the triple dues from the uh, 22nd infantry. So um, Ruth put me in touch with some of the people and it was just, uh, it's just been wonderful. Some of the stories I had one person write and say, I was in that battle on page 68 and sent me a photo. Uh, and there's another person I know that's on here today that was in, in my brother's unit. So um, it just, it, it's 
made the whole project worthwhile. Because at one point I thought, do I even want to write this? Do I even want to put this book out there and putting my whole family's story out there? And what would my brother think? Um, he came back, had a good life, but he acquired an Agent Orange related cancer and he passed away in 2004. And I had bugged him about why don't you publish your letters? And he just kept changing the subject. So it was after he passed away that I felt I could do the book. And I asked his daughter at one point, what do you think he would think about it? And she said, oh, I think he'd be really mad. <laughs> so I don't know. But for the good that it's done and the people that have connected and told me that they felt some healing from the book, it's made it worthwhile. So um, I, I felt like it was a really good project to do. And I see some questions in the chat here. Um, yeah, we do have some questions. Some of them I got into the PowerPoint, Annette. Some of them uh, came in real late and I didn't get those in, but if you're ready for questions, we can certainly start down that avenue. Yeah, okay. One thing, um, back when I shared that picture showing that, um, that big picture of all the tracks lined up together, um, I learned this later after the book came out. One of the other people told me that um, it was your husband, David Cracker, that wanted to have a picture of everybody lined up. And so it was done. And so apparently there are a lot of those pictures floating around. And that's what I'm told. Some of the Triple Deuce guys said. And then after that, there had been some ambushes and attacks and they never had everybody all together again like that. So mm. it was a very unique um, situation. So I thought that was just a, a real fun story too. Um, okay, I see a question. How did Peter's tour of duty affect the rest of his life? Well, it changed everything. He came back a changed person. And I know he always had a good sense of humor, which he still had, but he was, he was changed. You could tell that he had buried and pushed down a lot of what happened. And, and it, when you read the book, there are a lot of really terrifying things that happened. And, and then after, you know, he was on, in his early 40s when he got this rare, rare cancer. And that changed things too, because then he was sick for a long time. And he dealt with it for 15 years. And it was kind of a slow process. It was right after his uh, youngest daughter was born. So she only knew her dad as being a person that had cancer. And then he died when she was only 14. So um, that was hard. And uh, he did come back to work as a journalist. That's another question here. Uh, he came back, he went back to campus thinking he would go back to grad school, but he was not welcomed home. He was shouted at and spit upon and started grad school. He thought he'd become a lawyer. And after one semester, he said, I can't do this. People were stealing things from him and calling him a baby killer. He said, I just have to get off this campus. And he went home and started his, started his journalism career. He worked for um, Channel 9, WAOW TV in Wausau. And then oddly enough, he's reporting uh, some of the war stories from Vietnam after he's home because that's part of the daily news. It went on for years. And here he was a 23 year old saying this war isn't winnable. And then he's still reporting it. And that what kind of uh, effect did that have on your brother having to, you know, report on the war that he had just left and, and wasn't really in favor of? Well, it, it took a toll on him, I think, because he would, um, he would come home and he, he'd like that job a lot because he was responsible for filming the news, writing the news, editing, and then going on the air. And he would have these long days and he'd come home at 1030 at night. And at the time was living at home um, because he was just back from Vietnam. And, and um, so he would sit up with my mother late at night and my mother would, would uh, pull some stories out of him. So I think all of that was bringing some of that back uh, for him, but he loved, he said that was his favorite job. He went on to another job in public relations at Wausau Insurance later on. Um, so I think he just kept stuffing it down and, and uh, didn't talk about it much, but he had nightmares. I know his, his wife said he had nightmares and, and would wake up. And 
kind of on the on the other side of of the the aspect there, Annette. How did writing poetry? How did that help you um, with with any sort of uh, you know trauma that that you might have experienced through your brother's service or things that you saw on campus or just the environment during that uh, that time period? Oh, it helps a lot. Um, poetry is pretty therapeutic. I thought about it a lot. I'd read those letters so many times and uh, almost felt like I'd been in the war zone myself, only I didn't have the, in, the terror that went with it. So it helped me a lot to deal with his death because um, that was really hard. He's my only sibling and, and now my parents are gone. So I'm the only one left out of my immediate family. So it really helped me kind of just deal with it. And I sort of feel like I have a good visit with Peter when I'm reading his poem or reading his letters and then reading through the poems. Um, it brings back the young Peter to me. Uh, we do have a few other questions in it. I'm gonna go ahead and screen share uh, my PowerPoint slides here. Uh, the first question, uh, do, you, do you know of, or can you speak to any differences between your brother's UW experience and your experience? Oh, well, he always said to me, I paved the way for you. Because <laughs> <laughs> he started, he went to, to Madison um, as a freshman, and I think he saw how much fun college was. And I saw how he didn't have quite the grades at first. I mean, he did when he graduated. So I was kind of following in his footsteps. So I knew to study hard and, and stay on task. So that did, um, that did kind of help. Um, what, so what was now the question, where to go? Uh, just just uh, speaking between, you know, what you think his experience was just at oh. UW just before you got there and maybe yeah. what your experience was just after he, uh, you know, landed in Vietnam. He was there during the Dow demonstrations in 1967. I was still in high school at that point. But then when I got there, things really heated up even more. So I think, um, I think we had a similar experience with it was the turbulent times and, and Greek was kind of out. And, um, you know, he was, I know that he had said something to me in one of the letters he wrote to me about, I hope you don't like take up with one of those hippies. You know, so I think it was just before the hippie movement. So that was really blossoming when I was at Madison. And there were a lot of people coming in from other campuses and there were other issues going on. Besides the Vietnam War, we had black power coming in and then we had other, um, other things happening. So it was a very turbulent time the whole time I was there. And finally, I think 1970 was Kent State that was going on. So the war protest was just escalating. So I think I had a little bit more of the, the turbulence than he had. He was just at the beginning of it. Okay. Uh, next question here. My screen share. Um, do you still create poetry with your, with your brother's service in mind? Oh, well, I write poetry about whatever's on my mind and it does come up. I've had other poems I've thought about um, yes, I do. And that's my main medium of, of communicating and writing is I like poetry because you take some prose and I just boil it down into something um, either narrative or documentary type poetry. So as things come up, I definitely will, will keep writing. Excellent. Um, when you were at UW and all these protests were going on, like you said, it's very turbulent times. Did you ever feel threatened or, or have threats aimed at you because of your brother's service? Or is that something that maybe you, you just, you didn't make, you know, public information? Well, it, you know, I guess um, I tried to stay on the fringes of it. First of all, because my mother was so nervous about having two kids in war zones and literally it, it seemed like a war zone. After I moved out to Liz Waters, I remember one night there had been a lot of demonstrations and then they, my parents said, we're gonna fly you home. And they sent me an airline ticket and there were uh, a taxi cab wouldn't even come on campus to pick me up. And there were tear gas canisters lying all over. So we had that going on. And I guess, um, and I just lost my train of thought again. What was, where did that go? 
what I'm uh, talking about maybe any uh, you know any, any vulgar discourse or maybe any threats oh. directed towards you because of your yeah. brother's service. The only thing that was directed towards me was in you know seeing all this stuff happening, but it was more in general. So one night, the night that Kent State happened, or the day that Kent State happened, I had a class in the sociology building at seven o'clock. I think it was an anthropology class, and the professor said, "We're not having class tonight." you're going to go out and demonstrate you we gotta like you know protest this war so i thought well okay i really hadn't been right in the thick of it i've been on the edges of it so i did i went out to see what was going on and um i guess there was a lot of there was a lot of anger and and uh, vulgarities and people throwing rocks and sticks and things so i just i found it terrifying i i thought it was uh, i thought I don't know that I want to get caught up in this. I really sympathize. I do not, you know, I, I understand protesting the war. I, I'm on that side, but I just didn't see that the anger and, and violence was going to prove anything. So I, again, I got into the middle of it, got a little frightened and left. So that was about as close as I got to anybody uh, personally. Uh, saying anything, but they didn't really know my brother had been in Vietnam. I mean, most people, a few of my friends did. So yeah, so that probably wasn't something that, you know, you, I mean, certainly you weren't, you know, screaming it from the rooftops, but it wasn't information that, you know, was readily available for other people to find out. Yeah. Um, the next question, Annette, uh, did you ever fear for your safety while being on the UW campus? And I think we just kind of yeah, about yeah. That. there were times, there were times when I saw the platoon of National Guard marching up University Avenue outside my dorm room window, and I thought, I'm going to just stay here right now. <laughs> you know, probably, it seemed pretty terrifying. That. And to, to see a, a National Guard uh, person holding a bayonet outside my classroom door, that was pretty scary. I can imagine. Uh, we do have a couple other late questions that came in. Uh, one, uh, this uh, person wants to know if your mom and dad, well, th no, if they were, they were definitely prior World War II veterans, but how did they relate to, to your brother's military experience? Oh, they were very supportive of whatever, of his letters and whatever he decided. At one point, my brother was going to go to officer candidate school and he went through some of the training and then he realized that um, officers often were leading people into battle in Vietnam and they were the first to go to Vietnam. So when my brother left officer candidate school, my dad wrote him a letter and it's in the book, a very supportive letter saying, we support you all the way. And um, I think both my parents were pretty fed up with the war. They could see from Peter's letters that it, we weren't making any progress. So they were definitely on the side of, let's get this over with. And at one point, my mother wrote President Nixon a letter, and I found, um, would you believe, a carbon copy of it in their files when I helped clean out their house. And that letter is in the book, too. And um, she had a lot of guts to write. She had, was well-read politically and historically, and she wrote a very intelligent letter to the to President Nixon about why, you know, why are we still in this war and why are you sending people to Cambodia? And, <laughs> you know, she knew what she was talking about. So I'm going to uh, assume she didn't receive a response. Uh, I, not that I know of, not that <laughs> I know of. I didn't see it. But then again, you know, a lot of years have gone. It's been 50 years. So I well, there probably have to be a whole team. I know. Of people I, I would love to those know. responses during that period. But I thought, and she said, well, to, Dear President Nixon, or whoever gets this letter, I mean, <laughs> it was really great. <laughs> I think we do have just a couple more questions here in that. Um, did you write these poems uh, that you were talking about today? Certainly some of them were written well after you were done with your, uh, your campus career at UW. Oh. Uh, but were any of these written while you were um, spending time there at UW during all of this uh, protest and angst? No, just the letters were written there because at that point I was, oh, I might have had a poetry class, but I didn't start really writing poetry until the late 1980s. So I was well out of college by then. So this is all in the past, but it's really helped me to process everything. And I will, you know, that's where I'm, I'm honing my craft all the time. So that's, 
you know, it was just something that came later in life, life as I had more time to do the writing. And one of our one of our viewers just wants to clarify, your brother was not an officer. He started in uh, the officer commissioning school, but he didn't complete that. And he went to Vietnam as an enlisted soldier, correct? Right. He did. He was infantry. Um, he became a sergeant. He was um, a lot of times, you know, he, he says in some of his letters when um, he was put in charge of a platoon uh, for a track because they had the previous guy was killed or went home because his time was up. And uh, so they had non-commissioned officers. So he, he did some of those things. He would step up and he did become a sergeant. He later became a company clerk. Uh, for his unit because of his writing background. Um, that had its own set of stresses because he had to deal with writing letters home to the families when people had been killed and gathering their personal effects. That was, um, that was difficult for him. Uh, and I think this is our last question, Annette. If I'm not mistaken. Did it come up? Oh, no, that was our last question there. Oh, okay. Well, do any other people have, uh, can any, uh, any other comments or questions? No, I, I guess not. But if I could, Annette, if I could ask you, um, once we're done with our meeting here, uh, if I could ask you to maybe stay on the line a little bit. Uh, okay. And as well, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I am going through my chat board here. There's somebody who... Uh, would like to speak with you offline, and I just want to make sure that I get you two uh, together. Um, oh, I, think I, it was, I think it was Stephen. Uh, but uh, for that person who wanted to um, be able to get with Annette offline, uh, if you could also stay on, and I'll put you two together, um, and uh, we'll make sure that, that you guys get your contact information uh, shared. Annette, we want to thank you today uh, for showing up. Uh, and for giving this fantastic presentation, I always love to hear about you know, not only the you know the war aspect of everything, but also the home front as well. I think the home front is is very important, um, and I, I think it's a subject that really doesn't get covered often enough um, in you know coinciding with the the, the, the war aspects as well. Uh, so thank you again for 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 bringing this to us today and for your fantastic presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, who joined us today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation as well. And I just want to remind everybody uh, that this will be going up on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. Uh, we will be sending out the links for that. Uh, so if there is a portion of the presentation that you missed, or maybe you just want to go back and watch the entire thing, uh, it will be available on the museum's YouTube channel. Uh, in just a couple days. And please look for those links in your inbox. Uh, Ruth, thank you for joining us as well. And uh, I hope everybody has a great Monday. Uh, we do have another uh, program coming up this Friday. This was kind of hastily arranged, but I think it's uh, very timely as well. Um, our museum director, Mr. Chris Kolakowski, and also our curator of history, Mr. Kevin Hampton. Uh, they'll be talking this Friday, same bat time, same bat channel at noon about the uh, conflict in Ukraine uh, and, and, and some of those origins um, that we're hearing about in the news so much nowadays. So please join us on Friday for that. Um, and again, Ruth, Annette, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope everybody has a great rest of the day and we'll see you uh, next week or at another time for one of our virtual events.